Awesome, thank you so much for having me. Hello, and yes, thanks Paola. It's great to see games and, and media students really taking the, the, the social, historical, economic, material side of these industries a lot more seriously. I don't feel like that has been that has been as, done as much in, in the past in universities. And for instance, I was auditing uh, a master's degree in one of really prestigious London universities, and they were not going into these things whatsoever. And then game students would go into the industry, find out that it's terrible, and leave. So yeah, so I think it's really good to understand the good and the bad and the ugly uh, to prepare. Anyway, so a little bit about me. Uh, yes, so I come from a more activist and political background, I suppose sort of been doing a lot to do with housing issues and anti-fascism and so yeah, and come from sort of arts background as well. But then, but I've always gamed. Maybe it's like an Eastern European thing. You know, we game. And so Quake is like, I'm, I'm very good at it. <laughs> Anyways, and then two years it clicked for me when in 2017 when the profits in gaming over, overcame the film industry, when I realized that this is huge, right? This is like the biggest cultural outlet there is. And politics definitely happened there. It's just that it's not being spoken about because us as progressives have really abandoned that field. Even I remember, you know, sort of being feeling judged for the fact that I am gaming, you know, because there's all, only certain wholesome activities that are being allowed in like, I guess, pro more progressive circles, so like gardening and like cycling and pottery or something like that, but not gaming. Gaming has always been just looked down on. And because people get abandoned or they feel I suppose, judged, then they turn into circles where they feel understood, then they close up and clamp up. And so I completely understand why certain, I guess, um, unsavory politics have, have formed in these spaces, but we're definitely going to talk a bit further about that. So yeah, I, I, do, I do some YouTube videos all about gaming and technology and politics and arts. I've just written recently for The Guardian as well about, you know, Brexit and the video games industry. Uh, yeah, I'm a committee member for Game Workers Unite UK, and I'm also a chair of committee for communications at Game Workers Unite International. That sounds me, makes me sound quite cool, <laughs> but yeah, but uh, yeah, it's all just kind of just trying to really change the 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 the, the, the communities around these places because yeah, it's it's been tricky. So I wanted to sort of explain what we're going to be talking about today. So I'm going to establish like I guess the two problems that I see. Uh, in the video games industry, and then obviously about, I will talk about solutions as well. So I'm going to talk about the history of workplace conditions in, in the gaming industry, and also together with that, about especially women's place in this industry, because I think those two come together, like, those two really relate to each other uh, quite intensely. So we'll go through this history from 1970s onwards, and what sort of politics have formed that and what happened in this vacuum. And then two really important dates were 2014 and I think 2018, uh, where we really see a breaking point to, to a lot of the issues that I'll be establishing. But a lot of the response from the progressive left, I think, has not been that great in 2014 onwards especially. And it's only now in 2018 that I see that there is a lot more interesting, radical material uh, kind of response to a lot of the issues that we're seeing. So definitely want to then, by the end of it, really just um, explain to you what amazing organizing we've been doing uh, with Game Workers Unite uh, since March this year. And I think, especially for you guys, for students like that will be coming out, you know, very soon of university into this industry. I think it will be a different industry than what it has been. I think we're definitely going to be changing it for the better. And I'll be telling you how you can get involved, etc. Um, and it really is just, I think, for, yeah, for, for to, to create a new generation of, 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 of workers understanding that they have rights because a lot of the time, you know, in these quite glamorous industries, one could think, you know, that they are feeling lucky that they're even there, you know, oh, there's a bar in my office or, oh, there's like a ping pong, ping pong table, I must be lucky. No, there's a lot of terrible abuse that happens in those industries and I think yeah, it's important to understand that. So, yeah, let's get into this. I'm going to sort of start, again, kind of from history, and we'll talk about kind of women's place in gaming and tech. And actually, the fact that women have been in tech industry for ages, they were the pioneers. Here we have, so em Emily Chang's Brotopia is actually a really, really good book to read about this, about the whole journey. And... Something has changed in the 1960s, but up until then we have Grace Hopper here, who she, she got her PhD in Yale and was actually 
well, the main uh, architects of the giant computer at Harvard University. She, you know, she had done trailblazing contributions for the development of computer lang languages. In the uh, US Army in 1940s as well, uh, requisitioned its first computer during the war. And these six critical women that were there to, to, to work on this were actually completely erased from like any PR, and although they were very much there. And then in 1962, three black women working as NASA mathematicians helped calculate the flight paths that put John Glenn into orbit. A woman called Margaret Hamilton also headed up the team that wrote the code that plotted Apollo 11's path to the moon. So yeah, I mean, I think it's probably a, a result of the war and the fact that you know a lot of men were not necessarily there. You know, they were uh, you know on the front line. The women has you know got got uh, really front positions at these you know, the, the, the beginnings of the tech industry. But then something changed. Um, in the mid-1960s, a large software company called System Development Corporation enlisted two male psychologists to scout new recruits who would enjoy this new mysterious profession. Because, again, they needed to, you know, to really hire more people at that point. So they were beginning to, to create what we would now call, I guess, recruitment agencies. So these psychologists, William Cannon and Dallas Perry, profiled 1,378 programmers, only 186 of whom were women, and used their findings to build a vocational interest scale that they believed could predict satisfaction and therefore success in the field. Based on their survey, they concluded that people who liked solving puzzles of various sorts, from mathematical to mechanical, made for good programmers. That made sense. But their second conclusion was far more speculative. Based on the data they had gathered for mostly male programmers, Cannon and Perry decided that satisfied programmers share one striking char characteristic. They don't like people. In their final report, they wrote specifically that programmers dislike activities involving close personal interaction. They are generally more interested in the things that, than in people. Cannon and Perry declared that their new programmer scale was more appropriate than existing aptitude tests that would help schools, vocational counseling centers, and recruiters across the country to screen for the best programmers. Use of their personality tests became widespread, which meant that people were being recruited not solely because of their talent or interest level, but at least in part because of this dubious assumption of what type of personality made for a happy and productive programmer. And so this was the beginning of a stereotype that persists today. And it was also sort of the birth, I suppose, of, of the entrepreneur, right? So like the, the, the alpha male that needs to sell the product as well. But moving away from tech into gaming, we have to talk about Atari, and in the 1970s, they were like the big guys in the industry, right? They created consoles, they made games, and it's quite infamous that um, the sort of environment, workplace environment there was, was quite dark, you know? So they would shoot porn films in the premises, or they would have um, board, um, board meetings in jacuzzis. And so basically, they were trying to look sexy, the company tried to look sexy, but ended up being sexist. You know, so uh, and they were like the big guys in the 70s. So that really sort of again solidified that like the 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 field as not you know not too welcoming for for women. And actually, this all really boiled over this year because in Games Developers Conference in March, Nathan uh, Nolan Bushnell, the head of, of of Atari from back in the day, was meant to get like a Life Achievement Award, but because of I suppose the recent Me Too movement and in general more understanding around these issues, a lot of people were not comfortable with that and, they, and he didn't get the award in the end and actually wrote like a little statement being like, yeah, I'm sorry, I guess I get it sort of thing. So that was, that was interesting. Then we have, well, these are kind of slightly random pictures, but I will explain you what I'm talking about, I suppose. We move on to 1990s and John Romero times and, you know, id software with, you know, again, like very sort of, I, the mechanics in that game and Quake as well were very, very um, innovative, you know, the engines and the movement. But obviously, because they attached like very sort of macho and gory aesthetics, it was really mostly appealing, I guess, to, to, to the male audience as such. And... So yeah, another sort of, you know, nail in the coffin of women being, you know, that much more in, in, in the gaming industry. We move on to 9-11, and actually um, U.S. Department of Defense was investing, uh, after, around, after about 2001, was investing hundreds of millions of dollars in creating sort of war-themed games. So again, this is not an accident. We're now seeing actual active involvement of certain organizations, you know, to sort of promote machismo, I suppose, in the industry. So again, another, another issue. 
But then things began to change. I, point, I would point it out with Wii, con with Wii console being introduced, you know? Obviously the mobile gaming as well because that was a lot kind of easier for people that haven't been that much into gaming to get involved. But yeah, so um, the Wii console was like, you know, was extreme, huge success for, for uh, Nintendo. And at the time when like kind of consoles were peaking, you know, and no one really knew how to innovate as such. And it was available for all family, everyone was playing it, and kind of a lot more women were playing it. So game creators were like, oh, wow, so there's profit there, you know, there's profit creating products that are not just for dudes, I suppose. And, and yeah, it was, it was huge. And I think that's when kind of, I think, more women began to be involved again. And then we're going to hit the iceberg. I'm sorry that I have to bring this up, but, but I'll have to. But wait, just before I move on to Game of Game, uh, I want to also just explain that during this whole time, where were the progressives, you know? We were useless. We were completely useless. We sort of allowed the space to just, you know, although it was growing from profits and, and et cetera, you know, and we just allowed it to, to just go. We were nowhere to be seen. Our agenda hasn't really been even part of the conversation there. So again, certain politics definitely developed there. Anyways, so sorry to bring this up, but we are going to have to talk about Gamergate because it's a big deal, right? But don't worry. I will, I think I'd like to think I'll make this a bit more interesting because yeah, you're probably thinking, what, what, why are all these people together? Like, what, what's going on here? Yeah, two years ago, world's political landscape was shaken when Donald J. Trump was elected the president of the United States of America. And you might be asking, what has Gamergate got to do anything with it? But actually, there's quite a lot. So until very recently, we had this guy, Steve Bannon. He was president's chief strategist. But ba Bannon, before that, was running Breitbart News. Breitbart News is like a huge, very, very popular right-wing website quite grotesque and fascist, and you know, they, they run articles such as birth control makes women unattractive and crazy. Um, the solution to online harassment is simple, women should log off. So yeah, that's what they do. And actually it's, it's really, really huge. So, and then we have this other dude enter the scene, which is Milo Yiannopoulos. And in Milo's words, Bannon made him into a star. Milo was working for the Breitbart news wing in the United Kingdom and was writing pieces like, would you rather your child had feminism or cancer? <laughs> Milo was one of the main architects of Gamergate. He got in touch with a lot, of, um, a lot of popular and important figures in Reddit and 4chan and basically began the, began the campaign. I'm sure many of you already know, but in essence, 2014, a few progressive women in games were subjected to the largest online hate and trolling campaign ever witnessed on the World Wide Web. Um, and a lot of it did spill into real life, you know, they got doxxed, etc. But yeah, Yonopoulos engineered a sophisticated members campaign, a numbers campaign and made contacts with influential figures in 4chan and Reddit to make the Gamergate the success that it was. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to call the training ground for Trump's campaign an eventual election, election victory. So I actually see a big connection between those two. I know that's a bit of a brave statement. A lot of people don't necessarily agree with me, but I think that was definitely stuff established that, that actually that was a training ground for 2016 as such. So in three months of autumn 2014, there were nine Gamergate related articles on private news. The website used to show open contempt towards gamers before that until the editors realized that it can be an often malleable group of people that can be used for their political goals. And they weren't wrong. But now and also critique the left's response to it. I don't think that, I don't think the way that, that the, the, the liberal feminists responded to it was very good. So yeah, were the women targeted by the Gamergate trolls correct in defending themselves against the brutal bullying they were experiencing? Absolutely, of course. But was focusing on their individual stories the correct approach to not only win the PR war, but also push towards a solution, a change of heart? Probably not. The campaign against the Gamergate, uh, the Gamergate trolls focused sol solely on the victim's gender rather than a better, more economically inclusive industry for society or even women as a whole. Now, does this sound familiar? Probably because this is precisely the criticism that Hillary Clinton's campaign was under, having failed to energize enough people to cast a vote for her. Liberal feminism was put above progressive monetary solutions. As horrible as the abuse towards these women was, and they for sure do not deserve any of this, they are nevertheless powerful women. Hillary Clinton, for instance, has probably received more misogynist abuse than any other individual in the world's history. 
But her fight against that could have been perceived as hypocritical when her policies simply do not adapt with female solidarity. So Clinton had served on the board of Walmart, a company infamous for building its vast profits on the labor of poorly paid women, and the target of the largest sex discrimination suit in history. Single payer healthcare, minimum wage of $15, issues that affect working class women. All of these policies Clinton opposed. So similarly, many women may not necessarily relate to the liberal feminist agenda and allies of the liberal games industry, when the people that are at the lowest class echelons of the games industry are constantly overlooked. The route that allows career prosperity in these areas is, play, is paved with blood and suffering of populations in the global south, creating the devices crucial for the game development jobs to exist. It's a sad reality that these women's voices are grossly underrepresented, even muted amongst the gaming community. The people that can afford having discussions about representation and top jobs creating the games are already lucky enough not to be dependent on jobs for manufacturing the tools that are paramount to the industry. So, you know, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, women uh, are subjected to just terrible conditions and rape for us to even get minerals in all of our devices. In Foxconn factories in China, where, you know, all of our phones and Dell HP computers are getting uh, put together, the, the sort of suffering that happens there is, is paramount. And again, I'm just shocked always that the games industry is like happy to sort of congratulate itself uh, with the wins here in the West, but is completely mute about these, about these issues. And I fear this may be seen as me blaming or the, these women or the left for what is ex uh, effectively a win for misogynist white, white supremacists. But we can only be prepared to take this fight on again if we understand the limitations of liberal feminism as an identity and, interrogate, and we need to interrogate the refusal to widen our ambition for equality. The fight for representation is certainly universal, but as women, we have been subjected to oppression disproportionately more. We should know how to be at the forefront of vigorous intersection of these issues. We should know better. Taking that on by the roots and challenging the economic disparity may perhaps be a more straightforward route, making it that more accessible for all involved. Identity politics cannot be devoid from class issues or they are in danger to being co-opted and be seen as elitist. It has certainly helped for Donald Trump, who besides his hatred of certain identities, has always promised the material change, change, jobs, 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 was his main message. Now, we all know that it was lies, but it helped in, getting, in him getting elected. It is our duty to acknowledge that liberal feminism did not have a strong enough voice to counter these misogynist attacks. There is no space for compromise. We must demand equal opportunities for all, and not just the influential. So that's my rant about, <laughs> about I suppose, the the harassment issues in the industry. Now, once you move on about other way that the left hasn't been very good in dealing with certain issues, in, uh, not certain issues, but like, I guess, just politics in general. So right now there's this whole new vogue of like political games and I just want to sort of explain how I think they're useless as well. And how I, I don't think these sort of very, very, th these attempts of like creating signifiers rather than creating like that looking at modes of production and material change, I think, they just build uh, echelons of social capital for many people that a lot of the time don't deserve. So once you, you know, bring up some theories, so Walter Benjamin is uh, a Frankfurt School scholar um, that sort of talks a lot about how our, um, our artistic work needs to be, especially if it's to do with politics, needs to intersect with material conditions and what it means to be a conscious creator, what does it mean to be a conscious producer. So in his text, Authors, Producer, Frankfurt School theorist Walter Benjamin argues that it is not enough to pass something off as having revolutionary content while still utilizing contemporary relations to production. It is essential for the author, artist, activist, game developer, to become a conscious producer, one who considers and evaluates their own work and their relation to the formal means of production in a truly revolutionary way. So again, I wonder if any game really can at all be of utility though we're still utilizing you know, the, the devices that are done under terrible conditions, etc. I don't think fine art necessarily has that issue, you know, because they don't need those devices, I suppose, to, to, for people to enjoy their arts or whatnot. But yeah, now it's going to be a rant about my favorite pet peeve is wood papers, please. I hate that game. I'll tell you why. <laughs> and why I don't think people should really be doing 
yeah, like political games like this. I don't know if many of you know Papers, Please. It was created by this dude called Lucas Pope. It went viral in 2013, I believe. And, you know, it was, it was just absolutely huge. It was one of those, like, first politically charged games, I suppose. The gameplay is essentially that of a border agency simulator. Well, it wasn't the first one, but it was kind of like, I don't know, it just went viral at a very particular time, I suppose, when there was a lack of politics in games. This is also even pre-2014. pre, pre But um, yeah, so it was basically a border agency simulator. The player is presented with a collection of ordinary people of all races and genders trying to enter the fictional country of Artstotska. So as, a, as the player, you have to sort of check the papers and then you become... You know, you feel guilty because you have to not let certain people in or whatnot. It's really, it's just preaching to the converted. Like, I don't really see the point of it. But pre So yeah, it preaches to the converted at best and becomes a rather self-congratulatory project at its worst. And in 2014, Lucas Pope received the BAFTA, Britain's most prestigious entertainment award. Meanwhile, the UK continues to enforce draconian border controls and use of murderous detention centers such as Yaleswood, Hammondsworth and Dungoville. So he created this game, never really talked about politics behind the game, people going through awful situations on borders, but just went around the world just collecting awards, you know? Great, because it's like super edgy. Um, anyway, so I want to talk about um, this, this quote that I think is really, really important when you're creating something of what you think has political aesthetic or political narrative in it. So this is uh, Maria Lind, and this is from her essay, this is, com this is going to be really funny. Notes on art, its institutions, and their presumed criticality. So this is talking about political art, but I think it could perfectly explains problems with political video games as well. So she eloquently creates an analogy between the act of telling a joke and the declarations inherent in much of political art. It basically goes, if when you are about to tell a joke, you make the declaration, this is going to be really funny, then in all likelihood, the listener is not going to find that joke particularly funny. There is just something about the initial declaration that diffuses the humor. The surprise factor is removed, and you can prepare in advance for something coming up that might be funny. A similar thing that can be said for political video games. If one initially makes the declaration that their work is going to be highly critical, it is likely to lose its criticality straight away. Uh, that's why I also think those like anti-Brexit games are useless. You know, it's just like, just another, I don't know, it's just, you know, for Remainers to feel to feel better about themselves or something, you know, that's not really engaging with the reasons why the vote happened the way that it happened. Um, that's what my Guardian article is about. <laughs> so, and also the right can easily create like, oh, shoot, a refugee video game, you know? So, you know, it's just a very pointless fight, I think. But I understand why people make those games. After all, how many people in the gaming industry really want to admit that one of their main rewards is a sense of superiority, a perverse high status, particularly when it comes with the added result of being viewed as a political game developer. Producing real cultural change, creating art that is not simply political, but done politically, can be a lot harder and lo a lot lonelier. So right now, for instance, I am working, um, I'm advising um, someone at the VNA with their sort of political game, and we're thinking of how to escape this, basically. And so, you know, I have ideas either, for, so VNA Victoria and Albert Museum is in London, it's, it's based, it's basically, it's, it's in the middle of South Kensington, which is a very, very well-off area with all the kind of oligarchs living around it. And I'm thinking perhaps, you know, if we were to create, you know, a political game, what could be the modes of distribution that would be a lot more interesting? Perhaps only people, perhaps we, we, we send a code and we like letter post it to only the rich people, like one mile radius around the museum or something, right? And so only, only they get to play it. Or, you know, what would be an, inst an institutional critique that where, where the sort of most modes of distribution would be a lot, more to, a lot more interesting rather than thematics. And I think this is where the Uber game is really, really interesting. Um, the, and I usually hate, as I say, political uh, video games, but they've done something really, really interesting. So it's basically kind of, again, Uber driver simulator with a quite in interesting sort of ending because, well, I won't spoil it for you, but... Yeah, but basically there's a bit of a shock at the end. But what's really fascinating about it is that it was released via Financial Times. So it's literally like there is a link on Financial Times website where the, then you go and play that game. So it's not via Steam or anything like that. And Financial Times is a fairly, you know, center-right publication. But because Uber Game was released via that, it actually can actually change someone's opinion. I think if it was released via Guardian, it would be useless as well. But yeah, again, so, so it's the, the modes of distribution that are interesting to me 
a lot more than the actual thematics, if you know what I mean. So I think, yeah, that's my rant, I think, over on, on sort of another sort of liberal aspect of the gaming industry that really grinds me. But yeah, where are we now? I feel like the, tw the time from 2014 <coughs> to 2018 has been very, very interesting. And because we are now, I think, really ready to take on the, the problems in the industry from a material point of view. And so you probably heard about, like, just this year, firings at Telltale, two, 250 people uh, fired. Uh, ArenaNet, two employees just fired because they kind of, you know, were arguing on Twitter with someone, but, like, really, it was, it was all a bit of a joke. And then Rockstar Games, 100 hours, 100 hour uh, workdays, huge crunch. So that's, that's issues. And I feel like for the first time, well, probably since EA Spouse letter from 2003, but now we're actually creating structures to change all of this. Um, and the, the, the industry seems to be taking it a lot more seriously. But what fascinates me about this whole thing and why I see this as a way wider political project is that, and why alt-right is also freaking out, is because, and this is sort of my like, conclusion to this in, in a sense, we'll talk about solutions later, but um, it is not through sort of, it, it is basically, it is through class-based organizing that we may dispel the myth of the alt-right that is propagating sexism and, and racism, and that that will somehow improve someone's life, right? For instance, there are people like Ian Miles Strong, who is like a big alt-right gaming figure, and he is terrified of unions because his actual influence will be reduced because his whole thing is like, oh, you know, but it's these migrants or these women, that's what's reducing your material conditions. But it's actually, if we start talking about how, no, it's through labor organizing and, and, and just sort of class consciousness that we improve one's material conditions then I think that could really, really destroy their argument. And they're kind of terrified, and it's brilliant to see. Yes, so these are not the only issues that we have in the industry right now. There is speculative labor, outsourcing, zero-hour contracts. Whereas they used to be secure jobs back in the day, they are less and less so. But traditional trade unions were also lame. You know, a lot of the time they're old, pale, male, stale, corrupt, bloated, and just really useless, that's true. And we have to also dis kind of dispel the, the myth or just kind of just change the face of trade unionism as well. So that's a huge hurdle. But I think we're at the, front, at the forefront of something really exciting. So yeah, this is where we're talk gonna talk about Game Workers Unite. And that was born in GDC, Game, Work Game Developers Conference this March, when a few people, and Game De Developers Con Conference happens in San Francisco every year. And a few people were trying to do an anti-trade union like panel discussion. And a lot of people were like, yeah, no, not having this. And actually shut it down, created the logo. The logo was done by um, Scott Benson, who created Night in the Woods, which is a really, really interesting game. And just started organizing. And it would started as just, yeah, a few people at the event then exploded on Twitter. They have now like 10,000 followers. And they have a Discord chat for like 400 people organizing and branches all across the world. So most of US states now have a Game Workers Unite branch, Canada, Brazil, Australia, New Zealand, UK, Germany. Yeah, there are quite a few. And it's a grassroots organization, so really anyone can get involved and, like, and do their stuff. That's how I became like, chair of the committee for comms, because I was just like, I want to do this. They're like, great, you seem to have OK politics, do it. But it's really it's just trying to, yeah, to help workers in the industry, because there are definitely issues. Um, and in the UK, we, we are now, we're like really excited. Basically, we're going to become a branch of, I, I can't tell the name just yet, but of a really small, dynamic, militant trade union that is not like the rest. And we're really interested to see how can we take this forward, you know? So for instance, these first two images that you're seeing is that we were releasing support to striking workers, you know, at Wetherspoons or at Uber, and really just try and connect different issues. And then what you're seeing on the right is one of our socials. We have lots of socials. We have basically have socials every week. And sometimes there are Tetris tournaments. We have salsa to so socials, karaoke socials. We're going to have like a huge launch party at the end of January where there'll be like DJs, grime artists, and yeah, consoles, and all sorts of awesome stuff, and bands. And it's going to be like in a warehouse. So yeah, again, what I'm trying to say is that we want to really be like present trade unionism almost as like a lifestyle, as something that you can really feel like you're part of a community, that it would be an alternative to those, to the terrible sort of um, communities that sometimes happen online. Yeah, and sort of Antonio Gramsci, one of uh, one other theorists, he sort of talks all about like cultural Marxism and, and or how we um, 
we basically need to like take on certain cultural um, outlets and change the cultural hegemony, as you would put it, to really to try and push our agenda forward. And basically, that is through cultural outlets that we can, you know, achieve material condition change as well. So yeah, you should, you guys should definitely care because this is your future. But yeah, we're also on the I think twenty sixth of. I think 26th of January as well, maybe on 19th of January. We're doing an international game workers unite social, so literally all of our branches are going to be meeting up and having a party on the same day. So they'll be sending in pictures and that sort of stuff. So again, so so sort of first about creating social relations and like relationships, and 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 only then about the sort of organizing, which obviously is extremely important. But like I think it's only through establishing those social relations can like can people feel invested enough. So yeah, that's why it's really kind of different from the rest of trade union movements. We also then want to include esports and content create well esports players and content creators. Eventually, uh, we're coming up with a certification system as well, where companies or projects that are you know doing good work with their work well like basically are, have good working conditions, we'll be able to provide them with our certification. So like Game Workers Unite approved video game. So they'll be able to separate themselves, perhaps, in this oversaturation of market. So again, coming up with sort of innovative ways to 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 push forward this this movement, but including strategies, uh, media strategies as well that are just untraditional for trade unions altogether, but but also for politics as well, because so much of our politics are just you know anger and sadness, and it's really important to celebrate, celebrate each other, and celebrate our achievements. Yeah, and you know, boredom is always counter-revolutionary, as they say. Thank you so much. Thank you.